Well, welcome everyone. Uh, really wonderful to see you all here. A, a fantastic turnout, really a, a great crowd and understandably for the amazing speaker that we have today and for the fourth installment of our uh, Stargates series, which we've been having here at the Warburg now for uh, a few months. And this series is the brainchild of Luisa Capodieci, who is the Francis Yates Fellow at the Warburg Institute, as well as being a professor at the University of Paris, uh, the Sorbonne. And we're delighted that she has contributed to our series of events at the Warburg by organizing this series of remarkable scholars on the question of astral influences and the making of talismans. So Louisa is going to introduce our scholar today. Louisa. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, John, for opening our Stargates with me. And thanks you all for, for coming. And it's a great pleasure for me to welcome Stéphane Toussaint, who studied with two illustrious teachers, Eugenio Garin and Cesare Vasoli. He is currently research director at the Centre André Chastel in the National Center for Scientific Research of the French Ministry of Culture and Sorbonne University in Paris. He is the director of the Journal of Ficinian Studies Academia and of the Marsilio Ficino Society. He published a large number of studies on Ficino, Pico della Mirandola, Platonism and Neoplatonism, magic, astrology, Hermeticism during the long Renaissance. His most recent book is entitled La Liberté d'Esprit, Fonction et Condition des Intellectuels Humanistes, The Liberty of the Spirit, Function and Condition of the Intellectual Humanists. Stefan is currently preparing an edition of Ficino commentary on Plato's Phaedrus. Today, Ficino is the main character of his lecture, which deals with an exciting topic. Ficino and the Sun, new insight and new documents. And we are ready to listen to you, Stefan. Thank you, thank you very much. Do you hear me well? Yes. Fine. So, um, well, I, I welcome you in, into my, do you see me? Yes, of course, you see me without problems. Yes. Uh, I welcome you into my, my chaotic library, which is more like a forest, as you see. <laughs> All my gratitude to the organizer of, of, the, of the Stargate's lecture. Luisa Capodieci and to the War Book Institute, of course. It is a great honor to speak in front of you, and I shall also pay my tributes and some, to some friends like um, Sabine Frommel, Ulrich Pfisterer, Jeremy Kering, and, and Philippe Morel for their help and, and support in this research. A most special thank to Monsignor Pacosi, who authorized my curiosity and my research in Santa Trinita, which is a little church. Uh, not far from the Arno River in Florence, and to Maria Paola Bellini, director of the Biblioteca Medicea Laurenziana, for the rare miniature of Ficino I'm showing you shortly. Uh, unfortunately, you know perhaps that a great, a, the greatest scholar, uh, Henri Dominique Safre, passed a bit alive this week, and he was the doyen of our studies. I wish here to celebrate his, his memory. In the last 30 years, the problem of astrology and magic with regard to Ficino has greatly changed. We can notice it at first glance at the level of bibliography. The number of articles and books has considerably increased. And if around 1990, you could rely on famous studies by Garin, Chastel, Vasoli, Yates, Walker, of course, Curiano, Zambelli, and Copenhagen. Today, you can no longer count the number of titles and the topic. Since I have, have you know, perhaps the task of compiling, of preparing the bibliography of Fessinian studies with my friend, Thomas Gilbart from Hamburg, if you are online, Thomas, hello. Uh, for my journal Academia, which is here. 
I had to check around 130 titles published in the last 20 years on magic, astrology, hermeticism, theurgy, and demons in Ficino's work. And I insist, I counted only the works explicitly mentioning magic, astrology, and so on, because there would be many more works, twice as many, I suppose, dealing with Ficino and magic, but not mentioning Ficino and magic in the title. In the bibliography of more than 50 pages for the last 50 years. Of course, there is a blossoming of studies in Ficino and not all flowers are roses. Anyway, we can rejoice because this is a pretty positive trend, you know. Secondly, we are seeing the mixing and blending of many different topics. We pass more and more easily from astrology to magic and from magic to demonology or from medicine to talismans and from amulets to demonology in Ficino's work. When in the past, it was almost shameful to speak of demons and of theurgy when one studied Ficino. And I suppose Christella's studies are telling in this regard because the seldom, very seldom quote magic and demonology and Ficino's thought. Well, the opposite is true today. It would appear almost reactionary to speak about Ficino without also saying that his De Vita or the commentary on Plotinus are full of demon gods and theurgy. But actually, uh, magic and theurgy correspond with ancient rites and very complex realities involving human activities like purification, charms or spells and priors, and for the gods, manifestation like responses, apparition, miracles. And clearly, when we wish to know whether all of that could be possible and could work in Florence, let's say in 1480. To give you a specific example, in Ficino's famous De Vita Celitus Comparanda, the Latin verb comparare has a double meaning. That's of to compare, to equal, to coincide, and that of to conjoin, to connect, to unite. Thinking more as a philologist, we may say that Ficino is telling us that one must imitate the stars, that is their celestial harmony, in order to be united with the sky. It is therefore a specific type of activity, which has recourse to physical training and mental concentration. And the enigma, to be deciphered is how we achieve union with the stars, which are perfect bodies and souls here below, that is achieving to be stars ourselves. As we know, for Ficino, human souls are stars. They are only clothed stars which are not conscious of their own stariness, if, if I may say, and philosophy, is trying to bring us to, uh, again, to a starry and astral status of the soul. This is a celestial proceeding and, and it is a very complex uh, operation. Um, if theurgy on its side consists of having divinities descent by conjuring, Ficino proposes rather to elevate a spy imitation by climbing, so to, speak, so to speak, as if on a ladder upon the astral influences which are coming from above upon us. But I don't know if that corresponds exactly for Ficino with intellectual theurgy, spiritual magic, hermeticism, or Neoplatonism. I suppose, I only suppose these artificial notions belonging to us 
And, and I would like noting that ever since the famous polemic between Copenhagen and Zambelli, no one agrees on the terms which should be used. Brief, is it helping us to better understand Ficino and to better reconstruct his world? In fact, it's partly a question of academic debates based often on the same sources and not so often on new documents or discoveries. My intention now is to show you that progress can be made in understanding Ficino, new insight acquired about his planetary philosophy and, and his astral theology. I let it to you making your own opinion on the magical nature of the new document I'm offering you. It could be magic or theatrical, it could be not. In order to figure out the complexity of Ficino's character, I'm going to take you back to Florence in 1480, precisely to the Sassetti family chapel at Santa Trinita. As I told you, Santa Trinita is a little church, not very far from the Arno River, and it belongs to the Vallombrosa order, the Vallombrosan monks from the time, from the very time of Ficino and, and of Sassetti, of course. The strip back in time will be all the easier for us since the first color to have spoken of Francesco Sassetti was the very founder of the Warburg Institute, Ebbe Warburg himself, in 1907, in his Francesco Sassetti's last will. So far, as uh, Sir Ernst Gombrich put it in the last century, and I quote Gombrich, in Warburg, the extension of the range of expression between pious devotion and migration of classical art motifs finds his precise analogy in the psychology of Galandaio's patron, the banker Francesco Sassetti. Warburg had devoted an impressive passage to that psychology in his paper of 1902, yet it was only five years after and his publication on Francesco Sassetti's last will and testament that it attempted to clinch the equation as it were. Once more, he postulated that the text of Francesco Sassetti's testament can be seen to reflect the oscillation, swaying movement between medieval trust in God and the self-reliance of Renaissance man. And it is quoted from Art as Cultural History War Books Project, edited by Woodfield in 201, page 60. We start by noting that War Book in 1907 quoted Ficino about a letter addressed to Francesco Sassetti in 1478 on felicity, nature, and fate. But War Books quote was almost fragmentary and left out a central passage of the greatest interest on the sun and its divine symbol. And here it is. No, I shall, um, yes. Do you see the PowerPoint? Fine. So, it is the letter to Sassetti. You have the Latin text, and I give you the excellent translation of the academic school, uh, the, 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 the school of, uh, um, of economic science, excuse me, I was switching with another school, school of economic science. Hello, Valerie Reese, if you, if you are online. And I'm reading just your, your translation of, of uh, Ficino's letter to Sassetti, the very fragment on the sun. And you have here the Latin text, of course. If the light of the sun were infinite, or the heat of fire without limit, no place would admit of darkness, nor the least cold be felt anywhere. We know that the one ruler of all the universe who directs and moves such a great body so well of a great span of time without ever wearying is good and without limit. He's speaking of God, obviously. 
if he is indisputably without limit and reproduces himself infinitely throughout space and exceeds everything infinitely in degree of virtue, where then does evil dwell if it cannot exist with the good and the good itself is feeling the universe? And it is uh, published and translated in volume four of the letters of Marsilio Ficino, London, 1988, page 4748. The latent version of the text is published in Ficini Epistole in the uh, Venice edition of 1495, uh, page 107. It is therefore, end quote, obviously, it is therefore in term of Sala theology that Marsilio Ficino in 1478 explains to the banker Francesco Sassetti his conception of religion and happiness in his own advice on human felicity. Two years after only, in 1480, Sassetti had Giuliano da Sangallo presiding over the tombs of his own family chapel in Santa Trinita, and also Domenico and Davide Ghirlandaio painting St. Francis' life and an adoration of the shepherds finished in December, 1485. You see here, the Sassetti chapel with the adoration of the shepherd. On my left, probably on your right, I don't know if there is some reverse effect, but on my left you have um, Nera Corsi, she was Francesco Sassetti's wife, and on my right you have Francesco Sassetti himself as a devotee of, of the Virgin. And here you have the vault of the Sassetti's chapel with the four civil, we shall speak of the four civil after very interesting figures. Since the memorable study by Warburg in 1907, scholars working on this exceptional decorative ensemble have omitted taking into consideration Ficino and his letter to Sassetti. Puzzling as it might be, neither Fritz Saxel nor de Chastel, Yves Borsuk or Dupré del Poggetto have shown the connection between the son of Ficino and Sassetti's tomb. I suppose this conference is the right occasion to draw the consequences of such an oversight. It is not the result of chance, but rather of a deliberate choice by Warburg. His incomplete quote of Ficino's letter, according to his own edition of the Opera Omnia Ficini, 1576, page. 246, was determined for him, for Warburg, by the exclusive interest he had in Sassetti's piety. Therefore, we find no mention at all of the son, completely overlooked in his study on Francesco Sassetti's last will. So, by deliberately ignoring this apparently pagan topic, linked to Orpheus, Iamblichus, and the Emperor Julian, Warburg deprived himself and his legacy of an essential clue. I would like to propose here the hypothesis that in the future, it would be difficult at least to understand Sassetta's tomb, signification, meaning, and artistic complexity without the presence of Ficino, who is currently dismissed in favor of Angelo Poliziano or Bartolomeo Fonzio. If we try to catch an overall view of the problem, a striking hole and the progressive course of scholarship, let's say from Panofsky and Wynn to Dempsey and Bretkamp, there has been a radical shift from Ficino to Poliziano. If you think, if you visualize scholarship as a speedometer, 
between the 1960s and the 1990s, the needle passed from Neoplatonism to anti-Neoplatonism. And it is not at all my intent to deal with historiography, but only to bring back the needle at the center of our Ficino meta. Uh, the post Warburgian criticism neglected Ficino, but in return, the Ficinian criticism was always much more attentive to the De Sole and indeed to De Vita than to the heliocentric quote in Ficino's letter to Sassetti. Nonetheless, I would say that this letter belongs to a very fertile production between De Amore 1469 and Orfica Comparatio Solis Adeum 1479, when Ficino also wrote his Quid Sit Lumen, What is Life, which is a very short treatise, but very interesting one, who observed that the symbology of the sun belongs around 1478 to an overall Ficinian strategy. And when Ficino's De Sole appeared in 1493, the opposition to his treatise drove Marsilio to write a vigorous apologia against the blind bats who were hostile to his heliocentric theology. And around the uh, 1480s, what kind of new ideas, more or less orthodox, does Ficinian symbology uh, introduce in Florence? Well, pagan sources are the first thing to come in mind, obviously with Orpheus, Julian, Macrobius, Iamblichus, and Proclus. We see Ficino extolling a strange syncretism, there is no better terminology, in harmony with Christianity. But let's prevent misunderstanding on this very point. Not to speak of ancient Christianity, for centuries in Tuscany, at least in St. Francis, in his canticle of the creatures, the sun stands for the eternal father. And I quote uh, San, San Francesco Cantico delle Creature. You have here the, the, the Italian text I'm quoting you. Laudato sia mi signore cum tutte le sue creature, specialmente messer lo frate sole, lo quale giorno, et allumini noi per lui, et ello e bello e radiante cum gran splendore, da te altissimo porta significazione. And to take the right measure of this spreading metaphor, one has only to read the Convivio 312, where Dante himself exalts the sun. And you have the texts uh, of Dante here, obviously in Italiano Volgare, with my translation, I'm just reading translation to you. It is not my translation, it was translated by Wicksteed in London, 1912. Wherefore, we are to proceed to the second verse at the beginning of the treatise in which I say, the sun sees not who circles all the world. Here you are to know that just as it is suitable to treat of an object of sense by means of a thing which is not an object of sense, so it is suitable to treat of an object of the intellect by means of a thing which is not an object of the intellect. And so, since in the literal exposition, the discourse opened with the corporeal sun accessible to senses, we are now to discourse of the spiritual sun accessible to the intellect, that is, God. During the Middle Ages, the origin of this topos evidently goes back to the De, Divinus, De Divinis Nominibus, four of the pseudo, the pseudo of course. But in the Renaissance, Ficino enriches the reference with his own peculiar brand of Prisca theologia, rooted in Orphism. From all this arises the Orphic comparison of the sun and God, the so-called Orphica comparatio solis ad Deum, 
And this is a letter sent by Ficino to Lotterio Neroni, Marsilio's great friend, on December 19, 1479. And this is precisely when Sassetti's tomb was being plenified. Now let's quote a short part of Ficino's letter to Neroni um, in my translation. I give you here in the PowerPoint um, the um, latent text of, of, the, of the, the comparatio. According to Orphic tradition, the whole sphere of the sun is filled with a spirit greatly superior to other spheres. It produces life in movement through the body of the sphere, and from there it is spread into all things in the universe. But through the planet of the sun, it produces intelligence and vision. Intelligence through the light of mind, which dominates everything in the center of the sun, only by the head. I underscore by the head, it is very important and vision through the visible light which shines everywhere on the complete uh, circuit of the sun as in an eye. From where certainly in the sun, visible light is created from the brilliance of mind and vision is also created by intelligence. Indeed, intelligence is in nowhere different from intelligible light and vision is nowhere different from visible light. Only three years earlier, in 1476, Ficino had sent to Febo Capella, a Venetian ambassador, another wonderful letter, the Quid Sid Lumen, which was to appear slightly modified in the De Sole in 1493. In the Quid Sid Lumen, what is light, one can read poetic chapters on the physical and spiritual delight produced by the sun. Accordingly, Pacino evokes the joy spread by the rays, even so far as to make human and celestial souls smile and laugh. Edgar Wendt, in his masterpiece on Michelangelo and the Sistine Chapel, already underscored the importance of this text for the artists and for Michelangelo. Michelangelo uh, peculiarly. It seems remarkable to me that that wind stresses the affinity between Ficino's son and the fiat lux of Michelangelo because it is a son which gladdens good eyes and hurts bad eyes. If we now narrow the circle of proofs around Ficino, Sangallo, Gerlandai, and Sassetti, what do we find in the Quid Lumen of 1476? A series of telling echoes, and, and I choose three of them for you because they are very suggestive. And I give you here the text which I'm translating. First part, first excerpt of the, of the Quid Sit Lumen. In the wonderful joy of the celestial spirits, the sky, similar to their body and even their eye, for our fierce name, the sun, eye, shows its laughter and its splendor and its exaltation and its movement like the earth, very far from these same spirits, shows its tears in its darkness and its lassitude in its immobility and inactivity. In the presence of the laughter of the stars, mainly apparent by the rays, all that is under the sky and above the earth is smiling. In the presence of darkness, as with sadness, everything grieves. And the second excerpt in, uh, just below, as for spirits, it rejoices at its own brightness and at that of the sun. Also the soul at the brightness and the intellect, but intellect is a light in itself, totally invisible because of its subtlety and its extreme abundance. 
Moreover, light is in the intellect's joyful truth and true joy. Thirdly, light outside intellect is a manifestation in bodies of the truth of sensible thing, the flower of beauty on the skull, pulchritude in its flaws, and the delight of the senses. And lastly, the third excerpt, which is here for you. Finally, light is, so to speak, a divine sign reflecting the image of God into this temple that is the world. And that to such degree that Plato and the books of the Republic called it child of the good. From there arise the cause, the conservation and the animation of all things. It is thus towards the life, the truth and the joy from which it has descended that light has fulfilled all beings. In, it, in its absence, everything seems to die, but in its presence, all seems to be alive again." End quote. Death and survival, tears and joy. We cannot fail to notice that the quotes are perfectly adapted to Sassetti's tomb. Indeed, many critics have emphasized in Sassetti's tomb the revival of the ancient style of funerary lamentations. But in return, what better message of hope and joy than a divine sun whose light and heat penetrate into the night of a black tomb in Pietra di Paragone, a kind of volcanic stone called Bazanite. And here is Sassetti's tomb. And you see the black sarcophagus in Pietra di Paragone, which is Bazanite. And all around, you see very clearly um, Giuliano da Sangallo's frieze, which is running uh, around the niche of the sarcophagus. Let's summarize what we have presented till now. In 1476, we have the Quitsit Lumen, where the sun, this eye of invisible light, manifests visibly its splendor with the flower of beauty, Pulcritudinis Flos. In 1478, we have Ficino's letter to Sassetti, in which the sun shines with an infinite radiance and spreads everywhere its universal warmth. In 1479, we have the Orfica Comparatio Solis ad Deum, where the sun shows its bright head, Caput Solis, shining in the universe and at the very center of its own sphere. And what do we have in 1480? Well, in 1480, Sassetti asks Sangallo to carve a bovis sarcophagus, a sun face, and a flower of light. Here are the two carving motifs by Sangallo just above Sassetti's tomb. So if you, if you see the very uh, the upper right uh, frieze, the caput solis and the flos pucritudinis are just above Sassetti's tomb. By comparing with other contemporary tombs in Florence, in the Quattrocento, let's say between 14, uh, 50 and 1490. The tomb of Leonardo Bruni, of Carlo Marsupini, of the Cardinal of Portugal, and especially of Filippo Strozzi's tomb, which is by Benedetto da Maiano in Santa Maria Novella, just a year after Sassetti's death in 1491. Francesco Sassetti died in 1490. We find absolutely nothing equivalent nothing equivalent. That to such extraordinary symbols, 
the caput solis and the pulcritudinis flos should appear in the Florentine funerary decor at the same time and for the same tomb, however, should not surprise us. They are no more than casual. They do derive from Ficino's letter to Sassetti and also from readings of the solar letters of the Florentine Plato. What impression did Ficino's son make on Sassetti? An impression all the stronger because Sassetti was then precisely thinking of decorating his own tomb. The symbol of the Fessinian sun fits perfectly such intent. Indeed, we have documents like Ficino's letter and his little treatises from the year 1476 and 1479 to be able to say that the sun face and the solar flower are not the result of mere chance or of stylistic capriciousness. Then we cannot exclude that at Sassetta's invitation, Ficino might have given to San Gallo some precise hints in perfect harmony with the personal symbology of Sassetta himself. What do I mean by this? Well, since Warburg, the critics have universally accepted that the centaur with the sling was a specific symbol of Francesco Sassetti's fighting against fate. And here is Sassetti's centaur with the sling. It is carved just in the same upper right frieze above the tomb. We should notice the centaur carved just below the flower, but above, below the flos pulcritudinis, but just above another anthropocephalic flower, this time without petals. This is the other anthropocephalic flowers, and you know it very well that we have no petals at all, contrarily to the first one. And in the midst between the flourishing face and the apetals face, we have Francesco Sassetti's symbol with the sling and the horse. So we should notice all those coincidences. And, and in 1996, Enrica Cassarino took up again the arguments of Dupre dal Poggetto in 1988 to confirm the Warburgian view of the meaning of the centaur as a fighter, a, a pagan fighter against fate, since, since uh, Francesco Sassetti was a merchant and a banker. He had to fight his way uh, in, in, the, in the economic world of, of, uh, of, uh, of the Renaissance. Uh, it was um, um, a merchant venturer, as, as, as Warburg called him. But this um, interpretation of the centaur as a fighter against fate seems to me very much monosemantic, because if the centaur represents Sassetti, what could be the meaning of his fight against a horse and not against fate? Well, a very old Christian tradition, going back to Basil of Ansura, fourth century of common era in his De Virginitate, interprets the centaur as a mix of rational man and irrational animal. And the Sassetta's medallion carved by St. Gallo, the horse succumbing to the centaur, suggests also the Christian submission of instinct to the centaur, suggesting the intelligence. Otherwise, the submission of terrestrial nature to a celestial soul. You will recall that in his Theologia Platonica, the Immortalitate Animarum, published precisely in 1482 during the works in Sassetti's tomb, Ficino attached great importance to psychic immortality. Undoubtedly, Francesco Sassetti, who was Ficino's friend, 
was anxious to show himself in a glorious fight in a post-mortem battle for immortality. In this case, the horse opponent would represent the instinctive, especially mortal part from which Sassetti was freeing himself and his ascent towards the sun, as if proceeding from body to soul through the experience of the pulchritudinis flows, the delight of divine light and heat. As a matter of fact, the centaur it just, is just emerging from the tomb when you see the tomb uh, just, when you, a visitor is just in front of the tomb, you see that it is just at the level of the top of the tomb. I go back to my, my pitolless face. Uh, so all of that is not the result of, of arbitrary analogies or fancies of mine. I agree we must remain disinclined to gratuitous symbolism, yet it is by taking into account Ficino's letter, the double solar symbol introduced by Sangallo, Sassetti's centaur, and finally the intellectual and artistic milieu in 1480 in which Sassetti was actively involved that we arrive at this conclusion. Ficino's solar symbolism is one important source for Sassetti's chapel, which is, in terms of artistic legacy, one of the most important monuments of the Renaissance. It is a pivotal work in art history, and not only in art history, but in history of humanism, for, for its very intellectual complexity, you know, under the battling centaur. Uh, we saw an anthropocephalic flower with a stern face, which evokes the empire of darkness, where the petals of solar joy never flourish. And that too was not unintentional in the setting. With the petalless face, Sangallo is making an allusion borrowed to Ficino's reign of death in his Derap to Paoli, 1476. I quote, darkness is frightful, Above all, because life consists in light and light in life. Terribles ante omnia tenebre, cuya et vita consistit in luce et lux in vita. Sassetti's center manages to escape from darkness, trotting or galloping towards the light, the divine light of the sun, of the Ficinian sun. Certainly, there would be still much to gloss on Ficino and Sangallo and why Ficino was so attractive for artists like Gerlandaio. We can speak of a depth of affinities between them because Ficino was an incredible source of meaning and mystery in Florence and outside Florence, a source for pulcritudo, pulcritudo flows, and for beauty of a deeper glance, to quote the part Keats. But I'm becoming romantic and, and my time is limited. So let us content ourselves with observing that the Fissinian sun is echoing syncretically with the Franciscan sun, which brightens the entrance to Sassetti's chapel. The Franciscan symbol is of interest to us for very precise reasons. It is explicitly pointed out by the Tibor Sibyl. It is the, the fresco at the very entrance of Sassetti's chapel. Just above the entrance, you see depicted by Ghirlandaio, the famous visio of Araceli with the Tibor uh, Sibyl pointing at uh, the, the Christ, the Christ's son. In, 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 in this case. And, and so the sun is explicitly pointed at by the Tibor Sibyl as an overwhelming sign the visitor must keep in mind. It belongs to a Christian theological tradition in the form here of the famous Christogram of San Bernardino da Siena. Do we need a last proof? of uh, coincidence, of concordism. If we look closely at the four sibyls inside the chapel this time, that is the cumin, 
the Eritrean, the Drepen, and the Sumerian sibyls in the four vaults of, of the chapel. I go back to the four vaults of the chapel. Here they are. And this, uh, this uh, Sumerian sibyl is the last one, just, yes, below the last one, without inscription. So I go back to my Sumerian sibyl. Here she is. If you look at those four several, you notice a large shining sun behind each of them. This choice too is exceptional, considering that a several represented with a solar attribute seems to me at least unique before and after Gelandayo. For instance, Andrea del Castagno several in Villa Carducci 1450 is painted on a neutral background as well as Pinturicchio Sibyl in the Sala delle Sibille 1493 and the famous Borges apartment. Moreover, when Filippino Lippi painted the Carafa Chapel five years after Ghirlandaio around 1490, he excluded any kind of solar symbol behind the Sibyls. Here again, the background is dark or dusky. There is obviously a complexity into Gerlandaio's frescoes, expressing a deep concern for Ficinian heliocentric immortality, combined with the apparition of Araceli, the Sun Christ of Bernardino, and the Sibyls. And you see very well, in, in, just behind the Sibyl, we have this huge solar disk, solar orb, golden one which is shining uh, in the vault. Now, going back to Sangalo's carved trees, it is all the more striking that opposite on the left, but on the very same level of the Caput Solis, on the right, we notice a three-headed trinity. There it is. I can't resist the idea. It precisely matches Ficino's favorite idea of the Trinitas Solis. In fact, since, 19, since 1479, Ficino had an intimation of a secret trinity concealed in the sun. This is why I dedicated an extraordinary chapter of his De Sole to the similitudo Solis ad trinitatem divinam, which of course reminds us of his earlier Orfica comparatio solis ad Deum. And we, we see very, very well the Trinity carved by, by Sangallo. So the, the Trinity is just, I said, opposite left. When, when, when the visitor is just in front of the tomb, it is opposite left to the, um, the caput solis, but exactly at the same level. So we have all this uh, um, ensemble of, of um, connection between various symbolism of the Fissinian sun. And, and uh, it is a sort of syncretistic theology, which is uh, depicted and carved in the Sassetis Chapel, but is a theology possible without a theology? Sassetti, as Poliziano depicted twice, and Bartolomeo Fonzio depicted once by Ghirlandaio in his own chapel. And the frescoes devoted to the life of St. Francis, because Bartolomeo Fonzio was the humanist counselor of, of, uh, of Sassetti, and Poliziano was a close friend of. of uh, of, of uh, Fonzio up to um, the fight between the two in the, in the Studio Fiorentino, but they were friends up to the 1480s, they were friends. This is the reason why Sassetti had uh, Poliziano and Fonzio depicted in the fresco. Moreover, Poliziano, as you know, was 
a teacher of Lorenzo il Magnifico's um, songs. So, so it was very important to have Poliziano included in the fresco. But Poliziano and Fonzio, though brilliant scholars, were not theologians at all. So it seems to me that if Ficino inspired Sassetti with his letter, and, and if he advised San Gallo on a caput solis linked to Plato and St. Francis, depicted by Ghirlandaio, Ficino's portrait could well appear somewhere, or not. In the light of these discoveries, there is a singular figure in the fresco of St. Francis renouncing worldly goods at the very top on the left above the tomb of Nera Corsi. Here it is, just the last part of the image you see. This is the fresco of uh, under the, the Cimmerian Sibyl. This is the fresco of St. Francis renouncing the worldly goods. And there is there on your left, on the very edge of, of, of the scene, a very curious singular figure. It is, it is observing discreetly the scene and the, the figure presents quite the same feature as the other Ficino five or six years older painted by Ghirlandaio in 1490 at Santa Maria Novella, this time in the Tornabuoni Chapel. Born in 1433, Ficino here in the Sassetis Chapel would be about 50 years old. In the absence of contemporary descriptions, the identification of a humanist in a Quattrocento fresco remains hypothetical as long as no other element for comparison intervenes. It is a good test, and fortunately, portraits of Ficino are quite numerous in Quattrocento manuscripts. Of the 10 or so miniatures that I happen to know, there is one in the manuscript Lorenziana Pluteo 7339, adorning the incipit of the De Vita of 1489, which appears to me close to the Sassetti fresco. This is a Laurentian Ficino, but he offers a good physiognomical link between the Sassetti Ficino and the Tornabuoni Ficino. So we have here all three Ficinos. The, the Sassetti Ficino 1483, the Laurentian at the middle Ficino 1488, 89, and the Tornabuoni Ficino, 1490. Everything considered, it would have been truly surprising if Sassetti, a friend of the humanists and a humanist himself, so proud of his intellectual connections, would not have in his own chapel, the portrait of Ficino, a much admired philosopher whose promise of solar resurrection yet carved above his tomb by San Gallo and painted by Gerlandaia. Well, to conclude, if the presence of Ficino's Sala theology has been forgotten since 1480 in Sassetta's chapel, it is partly because of Warburg's deceptive insistence on faith and Christian piety. As Gumbridge has observed, Warburg applied a quite oscillating or rather bipolar view to Santa Trinita, with Renaissance paganism on one side, medieval piety on the other side, and right in the middle, Sassetti, represented by his symbolical animal, the center fighting against fate. But the center does not represent only the Nietzschean instinct for, for modern self-assertion against fate, as Warburg believed, that is a very old and syncretic animal. Warburg's conception of the migration of ancient images lies on the level of a collective and symbolic psychology, while Ficinian syncretism is a question of religious concordism and of philosophical choice. This 
syncretistic stressing had much more importance for Sassetti than did the survival of the so-called demons of paganism. It is also why Puccino is much more relevant than Nietzsche for reconstructing the spiritual cosmos of a Florentine humanist. But, but critics have for too long tried to exclude Puccino from visual arts and from humanism. Undoubtedly, this was a, a swaying movement necessary for the post warburgian generation and the post panovskian generation. But consequently, there has never been a true search for concrete clues of a translation between Ficino's thought and the visual milieu of Florence, because when started from the principle that such clues did not exist. Because Ficino, they say, was not a true humanist, as was Poliziano, for instance. But meanwhile, I do not want to enter this academic problem, you know, going back to Cristella, about good or bad definitions of humanism. As a result of his dismissal by modern historian of humanism and Renaissance art, Ficino's interest in medieval magic was announced, but his interest in humanism and art was largely overlooked. But we now can be confident about inventing a new Ficino, who is not a fictional Ficino, but a functional Ficino with a true implication into a city and a true bearing upon the life of his fellow citizens. Sassetti and his centaur ascending to the Fessinian Caput Solis are still there in Santa Trinita. And they show us the right way for attentive learning and careful scholarship. I thank you very much.